on reflection, I, uh, I've done a little bit of research and I know that up in that uh, other Navy unit that was integrated with the American Army, there was another pilot who arrived in Vietnam when he was only age 19, but he was 19 and nine months old, had his 20th birthday three months after arriving in Vietnam, whereas I had arrived in Vietnam at just 19 and five months old, and it took me seven months just to have my 20th birthday in Vietnam. So I'm fairly confident that uh, I was certainly the, the youngest Australian pilot flying operations in Vietnam. Um, the Air Force and Army certainly did not have anyone younger. And uh, yeah, it's, it's a, a bit of a thing to look back and think, wow, fancy me doing that when I was just 19. Yeah. And now, you know, with a 21-year-old grandson uh, still at uni, I think, my goodness, I was probably pretty advanced for my age. Yeah, look, there's a number of uh, things that sort of stick in your mind a little bit. I, I think the background, though, again, is that um, we arrived in, in early 68. We arrived in Vietnam uh, nearly two years after the Air Force had first started in Vietnam. And of course, there was always a little bit of um, a niggle between the Army and the Air Force about the provision of RAF helicopters for the, uh, the Army, particularly during the Battle of Long Tan. Uh, a lot of those stories are quite mythical. They're, they're, they're built up a little bit. Uh, the Army sort of milked the system a little bit. And uh, in the long run, to their great advantage, they became the, uh, the people who flew the Black Hawk helicopters and the Chinooks, and they, they took over helicopter flying in Australia. And they did that partly on the back of perpetuating a bit of a story about, oh, it was so hard to work with the Air Force. But uh, my understanding is that that sort of 18 months or so before I arrived in Vietnam, the Air Force was learning the ropes. They did not want to be rushed into doing things that they shouldn't do. And so they were careful. And, uh, and certainly they operated differently to the Americans. The Americans had virtually an unlimited supply of aircraft. They could crash one and pick up another one tomorrow. They had so many pilots coming through the system that uh, it didn't uh, cause enormous issues for them when they lost personnel. But the Australian uh, aviation system uh, was working with far less aircraft, a very clear mindset that we don't want to crash aircraft just because we weren't careful enough. And we have a, a different attitude towards um, the, uh, the placing of our our people in uh, unnecessary danger. There's no problem in, in sending people into very dangerous situations, but only after it had been very carefully considered. But th I guess what I'm coming to is that through that time before my arrival, there was an evolution of different procedures, a better understanding of how to operate with the Air, Fo with, with the Air Force and Army operations needs. And so things were changing. And then during my year in Vietnam, uh, from early 68, there was the build-up of uh, extra aircraft. The, um, the, the numbers increased. The, uh, the power of the aircraft, the size of the aircraft, going from the UH-1Bs to the UH-1Hs, uh, made a difference. And of course, the, the number of people in the squadron changed uh, through 1968. The, the um, personnel in the squadron doubled as well as the number of aircraft doubled. And so there was consistent changes. And I can only speculate again as to after I left Vietnam for the last two or so years of involvement of nine squadron in Vietnam, again, procedures changed a little bit. Uh, they'd learnt 
a lot of lessons. They were doing things better in some cases. They had introduced the Australian uh, prepared gunships, the Bushranger gunships, which are Australian designed and uh, prepared. And so the situation had changed dramatically for the Australian Army in that they now very, very, very infrequently would need to have support from outside the RWF, um, which they certainly did in those early years. But from 1969 onwards, uh, the RWF could provide everything the Australian Army needed. Gunships as well as enough helicopters to transport a whole company of, of infantry which previously they needed American systems to do.